and these are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm Scott Steer of GeoEnviro Pro, and this morning's webinar is the first of a three-part series on soil vapor. Today we'll be covering the conceptual site model, as well as relevant guidance. Your presenter for the series is Dr. Ian Hers of Golder Associates in Vancouver, internationally recognized as a leader in the field of soil vapor science. The webinar is about one hour in length, with a question and answer session at the end. As questions arise for you during the session, send them to me using the questions feature in your GoToWebinar toolbar, and I'll relay them to Ian. And with that, I'll turn things over to Ian. Thank you very much, Scott. Can you hear me? Hear you fine. Excellent. Well, welcome everyone uh, to part one of the three-part series. Uh, today we're going to cover soil vapor conceptual site model, case studies, and guidance. Just advancing to the next slide, it's just, uh, this has happened before. It uh, usually takes just a few minutes or seconds to advance through the first slide. But we're going to cover an introduction to vapor intrusion, uh, basic processes, diffusion, advection, and biodegradation. We're going to then talk about conceptual site model factors, learning from the site data, uh, models, and then a summary. And I'm hoping that we're going to get to the next slide in just a moment here. Okay. Well, there's a lot of interest in vapor intrusion. Uh, continues to be a very uh, important topic uh, as I travel to different conferences and uh, work on projects uh, within Golder. Uh, we see it's uh, an issue at many sites, manufacturing sites, uh, dry cleaners. Uh, so I'm sure many of you have worked on uh, sites with uh, issues with perchlorethylene. Uh, gas stations, petroleum hydrocarbon sites, brownfields, landfills, creosote and coal tar sites. Uh, there is uh, concern over uh, carcinogenic chemicals uh, and toxic uh, concerns. Just uh, checking here again, it's um, this, okay, just a little moment here. We got a little technical challenge here, so we just got to get through this and, and move on. It's, it's uh, Scott. Um, can you help me here, or this is not uh, not advancing? It's not not advancing. Is it is it worth trying to close and reopen your presentation again, or? Hmm. Apologize for this. It's uh, this is unusual. This has not happened, and we went through a dry run, and it worked fine. Are you frozen? Is it frozen yet? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. We'll fix this. Stand by, everybody. Mm -hmm. All right. I think we're good now. Yeah, I see, your, I see your second slide. Perfect. Sorry about that. We're continuing on to uh, the scope of the VI problem. Uh, so one of the, uh, the things that um, you're aware of, it's difficult to avoid vapor inhalation. And there's um, a high level of concern uh, from the public. I particularly see this on some of the sites I work on in other parts of Canada and the US. Uh, one of the things not to forget is that there can be methane generation. Uh, we all know that it occurs at landfills, but it may also occur at sites with uh, naturally occurring organics. And if there's ethanol or significant quantities of ethanol uh, with gasoline, uh, so that's uh, something to be aware of. Uh, of course, in BC, soil vapor investigation is required for all sites with volatile substances. So what are some of the challenges that we face and some of the issues? Well, there are low and sometimes changing risk-based concentrations. And we know in the BC context, and I'm going to speak to that in a moment, uh, there's some significant uh, changes proposed. Uh, particularly for chlorinated solvents, they are persistent and mobile. Uh, just as a basic uh, process, uh, 
I'd like to point out the contrast with petroleum hydrocarbon vapors, which readily aerobically biodegrade. Uh, processes are relatively complex, and we note that there's a lot of uh, spatial and temporal variability, particularly seasonal factors. Uh, rain can be important in BC and can impact on vapor transport and also sampling. There are questions and challenges for soil vapor sampling, which will be covered in part two of the training. And then uh, best practices for soil vapor intrusion mitigation. A lot of new uh, advances in, in technologies and ways to approach this, and that will be part three. But it's essential uh, to start with the sound conceptual site model, which we'll do today. I just want to touch on the scale of the problem uh, with some chlorinated solvent uh, examples. Uh, the first site is a site in Redfield, Colorado, where uh, it's a manufacturing facility where TCE and TCA were used. So 111-trichloroethane, uh, which degraded to 11-dichloroethylene, uh, and uh, resulted in vapor intrusion in a significant number of buildings uh, in this area. And consequently, uh, many of these buildings were uh, mitigated. Uh, each one of the uh, orange or uh, yellow colored uh, rectangles there is a building that was mitigated. The yellow uh, line is the outline of the, uh, the plume, uh, in the 1,1-dichloroethylene plume. Uh, they found that uh, initially they thought they had bounded the problem. Uh, and what actually um, occurred is that the groundwater moved around a bedrock outcrop, continued to migrate down gradient in the upward direction on the page there, uh, and resulted in a significant impacts to many homes. Uh, one of the learnings from this uh, particular uh, site was that um, vapor intrusion occurred for uh, a range of different type of buildings, uh, those with uh, basements, crawl spaces, and slab on grade type construction. On the left hand site is, uh, or left hand side is a site in Ontario. Uh, there is a manufacturing facility towards the top of the, um, the photograph here, uh, migration of uh, trichloroethylene. Uh, in a fast-moving, uh, very coarse aquifer of sand and gravel towards the river here. Uh, the depth to groundwater here was two to four meters, uh, sands and gravels, and uh, really high TC concentrations in indoor air, up to about 1,000 micrograms per meter cube. And many buildings have been mitigated at this site. So uh, just, uh, again, just to point out the scale, potential issues associated particularly with chlorinated solvent compounds. Well, so again, one of the challenges I just noted were low risk-based indoor air levels. This slide here compares uh, the BC contaminated site regulations Schedule 11 vapor, which are air standards for residential land use for three compounds there, benzene, trichloroethylene, perchloroethylene, uh, compares those to some background statistics. And I'd like to draw your attention to those by uh, Dawson and McLary, the 95th percentiles. And what it shows is that the risk-based concentrations are lower for benzene and trichloroethylene than the 95th percentiles. Uh, they're uh, less uh, than the uh, PCE Schedule 11 standard, but note in some jurisdictions, including in the U.S. and Ontario, much lower, there are much lower PCE standards. And it depends on whether it's considered a carcinogen or non-carcinogen. The overall uh, point I'd like to make with this slide is that these concentrations are very low, and uh, in some cases, uh, they're lower than background concentrations. Just like to briefly touch on some changes that are occurring in BC as part of the contaminated site regulation, omnibus changes to the Schedule 11 vapor standards. Again, these are the air standards. So I've chosen just a few compounds to illustrate the changes between the current and proposed standards trichloroethylene, tetrachloroethylene, and chloroform. So we see that the standards are increasing for trichloroethylene and chloroform. Actually, for chloroform, this is a good thing because we often saw uh, impacts by um, chloroform coming off of uh, treated water, municipal water supplies. Uh, we see a reduction, proposed reduction, in the tetrachloroethylene air standards. And so this could result in some dry cleaner sites being uh, potentially a concern, uh, so something to note. Uh, these are not um, currently, uh, or the actual proposed changes will occur in November 1st of 2017. Lead scavengers are compounds associated with historical leaded gasoline releases. Uh, these can be of concern in some cases, and 
can we see an actual increase, proposed increase, and decrease depending on the compound. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, there are no changes to the standards for the BTEX, naphthalene, and BPH uh, substances, minor changes to trimethylbenzenes, and some higher standards proposed for some of the other chlorinated solvents. So just to, to kind of uh, summarize, I think, the changes, if you're dealing with a petroleum hydrocarbon site, there will be no changes uh, unless you're dealing with some of the lead scavengers. If you're dealing with, with, for example, a dry cleaning site, you may see some changes to the uh, tetrachloroethylene and trichloroethylene standards. So something to keep in mind moving forward. One of the things that uh, we see is, uh, or a trend, uh, with respect to regulation in the U.S. and, and now very recently in Ontario, is a concern over short-term exposures to chemicals like trichloroethylene, particularly fetal heart malformations. So a very significant concern for pregnant women uh, where uh, there's um, concern with uh, trichloroethylene at very low concentrations. And I'm not going to speak to the toxicology behind this, but the implication are what's called prompt or immediate response levels. So for example, in Region 9 of the US EPA, that's California, uh, there are prompt response levels, which are quite low. In fact, they're about the same as the proposed uh, BC standards. Uh, and so it's not uncommon to measure these concentrations in buildings. Uh, and uh, the immediate response levels are three times higher. Uh, so the implication is in uh, these cases, uh, you know, individuals, uh, residents, uh, workers have been moved out of buildings. And so that kind of is a game changer. It kind of raises the stakes, so to speak, uh, can be a very significant concern. We've been involved in one of these types of projects. But currently, that's not an issue or, or identified as a concern in BC by the regulators. So now we're going to move on to conceptual site models. So this slide here uh, contains a lot of information. And I'm going to start on the right-hand side of the si slide. Uh, first of all, we have partitioning. Uh, then we have diffusion. Uh, so chemicals moving up vertically or 